Hey everyone, uh, today I'd like to uh, talk to you about a uh, small size research project that we started back in uh, 2020. Now it's over and any researcher knows how cool it is to reach the end of a project and be able to brief others on that. A few words about myself. I'm a um, had, uh, uh, well, my title is long, it's uh, Embedded Security Researcher, uh, but, uh, well, uh, I'll just call it Positive Technologist. Uh, I also used to teach for a decade at the Bauman University, and this year I finished my book. Uh, and uh, fortunately, it is also called uh, Built-in uh, System Reverse Engineering, and it's gonna be uh, useful for reverse engineers who don't know know how to uh, deal with uh, hardware rever reverse engineering. By the way, I have a copy of my book and I will give it uh, out to uh, a person who asks me the best question. So, as for the agenda, I'll brief you on the wiring board and uh, tell you why we started this uh, in 2020. Well, uh, when I did the, the revamping of my flat, I decided to establish a smart home and I had several requirements, several specifications. I wanted it to uh, work without uh, uh, uh internet uh, connectivity so that I wouldn't have to uh, hack it myself uh, to be able to introduce any amendments that I would like to do. And uh, I, want the, I wanted the solution to be as flexible as possible. I came across a wire and board that produces an entire range of automation devices, and by an entire range I mean that any smart home solution uh, needs a uh, central controller, which is uh, shown here. Uh, it's uh, a, a pro programmable automation controller, and lots of devices, relays, and other sensors that get data and control your uh, heat, heated floors, uh, floor panels, and so on and so forth. This is the seventh generation of the controller, uh, and uh, by default, uh, you can uh, use your root uh, authorization to uh, get uh, to get connected to it, and it's a good. It's a good solution. Uh, it's a good out of the box solution. There are lots of sensors and devices connected to the programmable automation controller and they acquire data or help you control uh, various devices such as uh, heated uh, floor panels, lighting, curtains, you name it. And one of the um, advantages offered by the smart home solution was as follows. Uh, it, it is managed uh, by wire. Uh, being an uh, embedded systems researcher, I know that uh, if there is an option to use a wire and if you are not limiting yourself, uh, use this option because you uh, get rid of, uh, you avoid lots of problems connected with reliability, authentication, uh, and so on and so forth. Because uh, if uh, you have uh, wires in your smart home, even if someone connects uh, to it uh, inside your home, it will be the least of your worries in that case. At the same time, they use industry standards, which is PRS uh, 405. Uh, it's a time-tested, uh, uh, used everywhere in the industry. Data is uh, transmitted by, uh, uh, by two wires uh, uh, that could be a, a kilometer long. And uh, the uh, data link is more than sufficient. And you can also use a netbus, uh, also an industrial, well-tested, time-tested uh, protocol that operates perfectly well. And, uh, well, the only thing that we need to know about it are as follows. Uh, it operates uh, on the request-response basis, and uh, there are several objects, uh, each of which have 16-bit uh, addresses. In the uh, Modbus RTU uh, is the remote terminal unit uh, that acquires binary data, and it has a CRC. 
Когда я делал умный дом, у меня одним из условий было, что... One of my specifications for the smart home were uh, devices that would monitor uh, temperature, humidity, uh, uh, CO2 and so on. So first, in other words, they would monitor the vital parameters. And naturally, I uh, wired the RS-485 uh, because the interface is basically the same. But uh, when I selected the solution, I decided to uh, see whether I could uh, hack uh, the firmware. It's one of my, uh, you know, uh, glitches. If uh, if I can uh, connect to the firmware, uh, I failed, by the way, to do that. Uh, and then I decided that I would uh, uh, look into it later on. I uh, assembled the smart home, but uh, then back in uh, 2022, I saw that uh, two uh, types of sensors were available and uh, those were wireless uh, wireless sensors uh, LoRa and uh, Zigbee uh, I uh, did my renovation from the scratch I used wires I didn't have any problems but if you are uh, doing a smart home if you're rolling out a smart home solution after uh, renovations uh, you would like to you would want to use wireless technologies and uh, uh, I was really confused about one line in the description of the device. Uh, it says uh, the mode uh, is selected uh, by a switch on the board, uh, both for LoRa or uh, Zigbee. Uh, and uh, it confused me because it's a weird solution. You could you could use software uh, to this effect. So my suspicion was that. Uh, isn't it the case that uh, the pr the uh, the producer wanted to make the uh, wi wire wireless uh, solution faster and RS uh, 40, uh, 8, 485 is a synchronous interface so maybe uh, the device does not know that it uses a wireless interface so I saw the images uh, on the manufacturer's website I saw the image of the uh, uh, switch uh, I read on and it, uh, it says that the firmware can uh, only be updated uh, by via RS-485. However, if you use LoRa, you have to add a parameter T10. So, uh, my face expression was similar to this of Fry, and I thought that uh, if something was wrong here. Uh, this is Warren Board security approach, and I, by the way, I would say that I respect these guys a lot because in embedded uh, updates are very rare, if at all. And these guys update uh, and upgrade their uh, uh, software on a constant basis. So they update firmware on a constant basis. So the firmware is encrypted. Uh, and, uh, well, it seems to be that the guys uh, deserve uh, respect all around, but uh, I still have my doubts. So I decided to buy the sensor with the LoRa interface uh, and uh, the part that is installed in the controller to uh, make the connection. Then I started uh, deep diving into the LoRa and it, it turned out that my initial suspicions that this is LoRa in UART uh, were confirmed because they use the the uh, e-byte uh, chip inside and uh, its uh, specifications uh, over exceed uh, the solution because you know uh, it has a range of seven kilometers and you would never need it in a city and I started reading the manual and uh, they, it said that they had encryption and uh, it, it offers good protection against data uh, theft because everything is encrypted, so uh, I said, fine. Uh, I had data sheet, I started reading the manual, and uh, it became clear to me that the module operates in four different modes uh, set by uh, two uh, pins, M1 uh, and M0. So uh, the, the, both of them could either be 0 or 1. That means that it's, it's either a deep sleep node or normal mode. And uh, to set the configuration, M1 should be 1 and M1 should be 0. Uh, M0 should be 0. And we cannot do that. So uh, it's a config by default. Well, let's take a look at the register registers. 16-bit uh, address, 8-bit uh, uh, specified the sub subnet, 
there are 129 um, frequencies uh, that you can select from, and uh, the 16 uh, bit, uh, bits are allocated for the key, and you can set the key. To encrypt uh, the data transmission, 16-bit is not that much, but it's better than nothing, especially given the fact that you can that you can use other variables, and uh, that means that it's not that simple. However, if you take a closer look, you'll see that the register registers are both uh, uh, read and write. So we all know all the parameters, including the address, and the module uh, operates in the broadcast. Uh, there is a, a sub-channel number and the subnet uh, number. Uh, so maybe the device knows that it transmits data via LoRa and it will be encrypted. To, uh, to test that, we sniffed uh, traffic from a uh, device to the uh, uh, controller and we see the mod bus, which means that uh, f from the um, mode, uh, from, from device to the uh, the traffic is not encrypted. So uh, what do we do? We buy another uh, another module and it was uh, a problem. Then you have to set up a new model as a monitor with a uh, with a wire board and channel. And then uh, brute force a 16-bit key. Uh, well, even if you allocate two seconds per uh, try per attempt, it would take it take 18 hours. This is the time required uh, to implement an attack within a short period of time. So I bought I bought uh, a device with a slightly different antenna, but this is not important. I uh, got all the parameters, which are quite similar to the previous one. So uh, I programmed the sensor with the required parameters, and I set the utility tool uh, that could brute force the 16-bit key to identify the right one. Then I uh, started, and it turned out uh, that uh, it's a default. Uh, it's the default key. Uh, I uh, should have tested that from the get-go, but, uh, you know, I want to prepare to brute force it, but it came as a surprise. So it set me thinking, what can I do with that? Because we're basically in the, in the very same network. We can substitute uh, the data. We can send to uh, the sensor various commands uh, as if we were a controller. We can also try to fuzz uh, the uh, control by sending uh, incorrect data. But I wanted to uh, m uh, they modify the firmware of the sensor itself because it's, the manual said that it was encrypted. In wire and board, uh, there is a standard app that uh, can uh, track several parameters, but we're only interested in the G parameter, which is uh, put the sensor in the loading mode uh, so that we so uh, we, we use the LoRa to uh, set it into the load mode. And that means that we can fully control the device. But I said that the firmware was encrypted, so uh, what's uh, the interest in uh, uh, rewriting an encrypted uh, firmware? So I wanted to dig deeper uh, into the structure of the device itself, and maybe uh, some hardware implementations could, uh, could uh, help us decrypt the firmware. And the uh, sensor itself uh, is based on the uh, Giga device microcontroller uh, manufactured by a Chinese vendor, and uh, it is uh, compatible uh, with uh, with the STM Electronics uh, uh, of the F0 series. And the chips I bought back in 2020 were based on STM, while this one it was based on the Giga device. But again, this is not relevant, at least I thought so initially. The uh, EEPROM 12C EEPROM 128 bytes, uh, that was sufficient, and 
and the footprint for uh, debugging connection uh, was also there. And this is something that all uh, embedded uh, reverse engineers like. If you had never worked with embedded, you can call it the ORMA analog or uh, uh, JTAG uh, analog. Uh, JTAG is probably something that you have heard of. And its functions allows you uh, to uh, debug a device. You can get access to RAM, to flash memory, you can get access to register, you can uh, set breakpoints, and so on and so forth. So you have lots of options to debug a device and get info on the firmware unless, of course, uh, the interface is locked, uh, which uh, is possible. Then we use the G-Link tools uh, to uh, connect to the interface, and we noticed that if the interface was totally uh, off, then you wouldn't see any response. But initially we used the uh, G-Link uh, tool, uh, and it uh, got access to a registry uh, and a gigaport that stored the indicator which means that the debugging interface uh, was operational. Uh, when we tried to uh, connect the uh, open uh, on CD, uh, we uh, could not do that. And the pin of the uh, uh, device is in the reset mode, uh, in a constant reset mode. And that means that we can at least uh, read the uh, identifier. Uh, and, but that was the only option. No RAM, no flash, no breakpoints. Uh, the only thing you can get is the ID, and you can uh, look through the uh, registers inside the microcontroller, and they were in the reset, by the way. As for uh, security protection, level zero is uh, no protection, level one and level two. Level one allows you to uh, read the RAM and you can downgrade this mode. Uh, there is a special uh, command that can be sent uh, for it to be downgraded to level zero. As for level two, it's called no debug and uh, the description uh, makes it clear that in this mode, the uh, SV SWD interface uh, can be switched off. And uh, this is what I saw uh, in 2020 when I tried to uh, connect to the STM uh, inter interface. Now let's uh, take a look at how they called in the Giga device chip. By the way, you cannot downgrade the level two. Once the microchip, uh, microchip's firmware is updated to level two, you will not be able to downgrade it. In GD, uh, we saw the very same thing. No protection, uh, protection level low, and protection level high. And the description was similar to that of STM. However, if you... Well, it's, it's still unclear whether you can uh, turn the interface off. It doesn't say uh, that uh, clearly, so I had to double check it. And to do that, I had to uh, buy uh, new uh, Giga device chips. And the first, uh, and of course, what we did, we bought the motherboard. And uh, you can only buy it from AliExpress. Uh, they never delivered it to me. So I decided to, I wanted to manufacture it, but I was too lazy, so I bought several new chips. and. I uh, found the modules by wire and board uh, on the Avita uh, platform. Uh, they had the debug footprint uh, and the Modbus. So this is uh, that's all that we needed. And the minimal uh, goal, the minimal objective uh, of this uh, motherboard is uh, to con control uh, industrial refrigerators. I didn't uh, care about that. Uh, I wanted to uh, get a blank chip uh, to put it to put on the motherboard. And uh, uh, Alexei uh, will give you details uh, on the giga vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, in the follow-up uh, presentation, but let me let me move on. Alexei uh, started researching uh, the chips, uh, and uh, I uh, focused on OSINT. Wiring board guys uh, uh, established the CI/CD process perfectly well. They have uh, encryption keys, uh, and uh, the developers uh, don't have the encryption keys. By the way, uh, they. Uh, 
they send the info to the build server and they get encrypted the firmware just like uh, it would be the case with an ordinary user who would get uh, who would go to their cloud even the uh, uh, repository names are uh, edited in github there is a uh, bootloader of four, of four kilobytes, and the firmware does not uh, have the so uh, the so-called uh, AB update. When you have the main update and the backup update, uh, if uh, everything is fine with the backup update, you uh, launch the main one. And. Uh, Another important thing is that there are two update tools, uh, the uh, flasher and updater. Uh, a flasher is a low-level updater. Uh, you can manually uh, specify the uh, firmware file that you want to download. So uh, let's go to the GitHub uh, repository. Uh, there are 200 of them, uh, and if you uh, combine that with the number of wire and board uh, repositories and contributors who commit, uh, for their files to their repository. But the problem was we didn't know what we were looking for. Uh, we uh, we started looking uh, for key, cipher, and other words. They didn't help us any, so we had to manually crawl for the uh, best repository. We found the uh, uh, tools, uh, updater and flasher uh, codes, uh, and the and the mass encrypt folder uh, and uh, so uh, let's take a look at the flasher uh, open source code uh, and uh, the firmware uh, is updated via modbus registers uh, you get an info block of 30, 32 bytes great uh, the firmware is updated uh, by 136 byte uh, size chunks no difference between uh, f uh, firmware and bootloader updates so it's up to the microcontroller that we're updating that's an interesting uh, point uh, in the uh, Modbus, uh, the Modbus uh, protocol description uh, stated uh, no read commands or cipher name. In other words, nothing that would help us in our research. I already told you that Modbus uh, has four different uh, registers uh, they, which are called coils and uh, you can brute force them. So we patched the flasher in such a way as to uh, brute force them and uh, we read the values. We didn't come across anything useful. Like I said, uh, we uh, came across the very same data that we saw in the manual and this is great because if you start reading additional information you would get a response. In our case it's no, it was not the case. Uh, uh, we had the zeros and FFs, but uh, they didn't help us any. Uh, we uh, did not write anything because uh, we only had one LoRa device and it was next to impossible to buy it. Uh, you could only pre-order it with the lead time of two months and we didn't want to wait for that long. And the four objects uh, uh, 65, of 65,000 536 addresses, you know, that's too uh, many. And if uh, uh, so, we started looking uh, and analyzing the firmware. Uh, we uh, try to update the uh, device via Modbus uh, and uh, the system crashed right at the uh, at, at the compromised part, and that means that the integrity is tested, and uh, the uh, crash was caused by the invalid block. When we compare different versions of the firmware, it turned out that we used the very same key for both the firmware and the bootloader in the entire uh, device family. And we realized that because the bytes were the same, if the entropy is good and if something something uh, is the same at the beginning, uh, then uh, the key is the same. Right, so we uh, carried out follow-up analysis. A lot of binary differences. So we did our calculations and it turned out that the block was about 64 bytes in size. 
And uh, then we start thinking, what can be supported uh, out of the library? Well, uh, death or uh, triple death uh, or RC4. Uh, what about info blocks? Uh, well, it should contain the size, the device signature, uh, which is uh, public and yet, which can be found, and the uh, firmware or bootloader signature. I already told you that uh, the flasher does not understand uh, what it is trying to update. We came up with a list of the possible info blocks. We uh, sent it to the Hashcat. Uh, it uh, did disk probing uh, because it's one of the low hanging fruit, but we didn't come up with anything. Then we uh, realized that we could use the EEPROM, but we didn't, found, uh, we didn't find anything interesting, save for the fact that it used the SW. Uh, the interfaces, uh, but uh, it was not used, they were reassigned uh, so that uh, they could be used as E2C. Nothing interesting. Uh, we uh, analyzed the local requests. It was uh, of no interest uh, in our research. When I did GitHub analysis, I, real, I uh, saw that there was an, a very old script. That uh, specified RDP level one for STM, and for uh, for that level, uh, there are uh, known attacks uh, for reading uh, flash. Uh, we started looking for old devices. However, uh, this vector was not a success either. Uh, well, we just found an analog for a wiring board. We bought it just in case, though we didn't know what the difference was. It was based on Giga Device F1 series. It's a more advanced series. However, uh, it didn't even have a uh, bit uh, protection, and uh, the firmware has nothing to do with the wiring board. Uh, and uh, the, the follow-up research uh, met a dead end because we couldn't get additional data uh, to move on with our research. And uh, Alexei uh, was still uh, analyzing the GIG device uh, chip. And uh, sometime later, he found the first vulnerability uh, that uh, allowed us uh, to uh, use the GD32 microcontroller, uh, which is uh, installed in uh, all the devices and uh, sensors. And wire and, wire and board guys use the same architecture uh, to uh, uh, configure their own devices, and they use the very same chips. And Alexei uh, found this uh, vulnerability that we could read the RAM. Uh, indeed, uh, we could do that, uh, but uh, we did not find immediately uh, uh, something that we could work on, despite the fact that the research itself was great. Then we realized that we didn't have enough resources. We didn't have the AB uh, update, the firmware that was updated via the Modbus register with blocks of 32 bytes, and some of them were uh, used to verify the integrity of the chunk. And naturally, it was uploaded into the RAM during the update. Then it had to be decrypted and placed to the uh, RAM before writing to flash. And that means that we could uh, read RAM. Uh, then everything became much clearer. We did several iterations to update the firmware. The firmware. Then we uh, read the RAM, and that helped us read uh, the bootloader. Since the firmware is updated via bootloader, we uh, 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 we got the keys uh, that uh, we could use to uh, decipher any update. And of course, uh, we uh, experimented with a uh, small uh, motherboard for uh, the industrial refrigerator. But since the architecture was uh, the same, we reiterated the same process uh, with the device, and we deciphered the firmware. As you can see, these are the stake pointers uh, and uh, vectors for the Cortex-M. So we uh, started in investigating the bootloader and found the XTA block cipher. Uh, the first one uses the 128-byte data block and 8 bytes uh, for integrity control. And that's why the firmware engineer uh, understands uh, whether uh, any uh, chunk uh, is 
short circuited. But we wanted to update our firmware, right? So uh, we found some irrelevant data, in other words, the uh, message that is returned to, uh, to Modbus. We developed uh, a encryption and decryption firmware, firmware decryption encryption tool, and we try to update it via, via the wire, as uh, is specified in the in the manual. Everything w uh, went fine, but we wanted to update uh, in the wireless mode, so we uh, specified the relevant timeout, and we still. Uh, saw an error. In a nutshell, it turned out that despite the fact that you uh, uh, use the timeout as a key, if you uh, go in deep into the lead mod bus, you'll see a hard code. Uh, and uh, that's why timeout gives you an error. If you patch it, every, everything goes smoothly. We, up, we started the update. The update uh, took 273 blocks, and we crashed on block 16. So uh, when we did the update uh, 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 via the wire, everything went fine, uh, which means that uh, uh, encryption is great. Uh, the problem is that we use LoRa. So uh, what was wrong? Uh, we were in the MIPM, uh, and uh, our uh, device was the master-slave uh, under the master-slave relation, and it has it has no idea that we're in the MIPM uh, mode. So. That caused a conflict of interest, but uh, we decided that it was not a problem. We have a command that we could uh, use to uh, change the Modbus address for another one, because Modbus uh, has eight uh, bytes uh, for the address. So we tried to do that, and it was a success. Uh, we uh, uh, we crushed uh, on block 47 out of 273. Uh, we changed the Modbus address, but uh, the but Laura operates in the broadband. So we uh, we did not select the LoRa address, which means that the controller still uh, controls the device, and Modbus goes over LoRa, uh, and our crash happens at the LoRa level. So it did not work, and we decided that we needed a brand new plan. Uh, it was an arguable solution, but this is the first thing that crossed our minds. Uh, we decided to take a look at the uh, pattern uh, to f uh, used by, by the controller for polling the devices. So we used the flasher in such a way so that it would uh, send the packets uh, when uh, the controller does not did not pull uh, the uh, device. We um, changed the mod bus address to stay on the safe side. We already had the code line. We updated the firmware while uh, Laura uh, isn't busy, and then we uh, restored the mod bus address. This is not the first iteration, by the way. Uh, we fine-tuned the polling. Uh, but ultimately, our device successfully updated uh, in the wireless mode. Uh, it uh, seemed to be a success story, but uh, uh, what if what if uh, we failed? Uh, did we have another brand new plan? We did. When we uh, when we analyzed the LoRa module, we uh, saw a very weird remark uh, that that uh, was used to describe the normal mode. It reads, supports configuration over air via, spe via special command. In a normal mode, you can use a special command to uh, reconfigure LoRa. We did not find any authorization, so uh, all, it need, all you need is to uh, get co connect to the same network, uh, then send the CF uh, special command, uh, and 
and uh, that means that you can uh, update the firmware by uh, over air. So the brand uh, new plan was as follows: since uh, we uh, uh, we were in the same uh, network, we would uh, just uh, reconfigure uh, the LoRa via the uh, this command. We would uh, change the frequency, the data link, and other parameters. And the wireless mode would uh, get disconnected, and we would uh, reconfigure uh, from the MIPM uh, this uh, device. So we would update the firmware and uh, recover the configuration. We uh, decided against testing that because uh, the f uh, first brand new plan worked in our case. Uh, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. In conclusion, I just wanted to mention that oftentimes uh, when you implement uh, some embedded solutions, you have to keep in mind that hardware is a root of trust. And unless you pay due attention to uh, the hardware that you're going to use for your solution sooner or later, even if you do pay attention sooner or later, uh, Hardware vulnerabilities uh, may be a way to hack your solution. Giga device mi microcontrollers uh, had several vulnerabilities, and Alexey will cover them in his presentation because this vulnerability was just the starting point which opened the uh, Pandora's box. And uh, I just wanted to mention that the wire on board, the team uh, responded very quickly to our research. They planned uh, lots of fixes and updates for both the firmware and the hardware. And uh, their approach to security uh, indeed deserves, uh, is awesome. And I still uh, recommend it to a friend of mine uh, who uh, is now renovating his house. Uh, well, I, re I recommended uh, the wire-based solutions by wire and board to him uh, since he wanted to install smart home solutions. And wire is good, wire is reliable, and if you can use wire solutions, it, it's still a better option because it reduces the attack surface significantly. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to find out, uh, when you uh, analyze the firmware update process, did you check the uh, Modbus for uh, additional undocumented comments? So you could have done, you could have brute forced them, because uh, oftentimes uh, there are non-standard functions inherent in the Modbus. Are you talking about registers or functions? Because uh, uh, we uh, analyzed uh, both of them, uh, but we had just one device. We w didn't want to. Uh, damage it, so we did not uh, do anything extreme with it, but uh, there might be a comment that would uh, unblock additional functions if you uh, rewrite just one byte. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, well, uh, you said that you extracted the keys. Uh, are you saying that they are the same for all the Giga devices? No, they are the same for one uh, device family. So uh, you mean any device from this family can be decrypted with the, with, the, with this key? Uh, you can mitten it and then uh, uh, update the firmware. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was just wondering. Uh, those who decide uh, to de to develop their own devices, uh, what, what would be your top three uh, pieces of advice to ensure the right security at the level of CI/CD? Uh, what are the most obvious uh, problems that you can avoid? Well, as mentioned, the wire and board team in terms of CICD did everything perfectly. Uh, you can uh, go to their website and there is a report on uh, the way they structured and configured the CICD. Uh, the fact that developers don't have the firmware keys, uh, uh, well, uh, it's something that we rare, rarely see. As for CICD, uh, is this what you're interested in? I'm, uh, I'm interested in automated uh, 
uh, checks that uh, embedded uh, engineers can introduce uh, so as not to run full-scale audits of their solutions. What are the automatic ways? You know, the use of the right registers, the lack, uh, no uh, read commands, uh, This is uh, these are the most popular things uh, that you come across in Embedded. For instance, uh, data uh, read functions that can be activated through a protocol, or if, especially if they are not locked. I once saw a device uh, whose uh, firmware included uh, the signature, and you uh, couldn't modify and update the firmware where, but uh, right next to it we saw a uh, technological protocol with the function of uh, read and write uh, of raw data from the flash memory. So you cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, update the firmware, but uh, you can uh, use uh, the other function uh, without any authorization. So this is something that you should pay attention to. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, what's your take on the uh, attack vector and attack perimeter? You stated that the uh, the wire uh, reduces the attack surface, and uh, the wireless the wireless channel uh, is encrypted on uh, the zero channel, while the wire-based uh, channel is not encrypted. Is it the right approach not uh, to have clear text uh, by wire? In good networks, you have to encrypt the data, you have to cipher the data, but in Modbus, if you roll out the encryption of data, uh, you have to do it over Modbus. Whether it's required for wire-based solutions uh, for smart houses, uh, but we're talking about just one apartment, right? I, I'm not sure that uh, it should be done. It's uh, like over-engineering. However, if you're talking about automating a commercial site, or uh, if uh, you're saying that uh, you need to automate uh, some production facility, of course, in 2023, you have to make sure that even wire uh, link uh, is encrypted. Can you sell it uh, to guys who are engaged in uh, industrial automation? But uh, such solutions do reduce reliability. I wouldn't say that because embedded devices uh, uh, well, uh, only certain components uh, fail. Uh, for instance, if you update the flash inside the chip, uh, the first thing to fail would be the flash memory, uh, because uh, flash used in uh, contemporary, uh, in advanced uh, 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 MCUs uh, allows just 100,000 rewrite cycles. So, uh, you might think that it's a lot, but if it's done every five seconds, uh, well, uh, mean time between failure is really short. So, encryption on top, giving the uh, current uh, calculation capacity, I don't think there will be any uh, cons in that. How come they don't do that? Uh, well, uh, I guess because uh, some people believe that they don't need it. Uh, other, uh, in other cases, it's not part of the specification requirements. And developers just follow the rule book, and the rule book says uh, don't do encryption, uh, or it doesn't uh, say that you should encrypt data. So those people who think about it in advance, they they will encrypt data. The others won't. Uh, that's why uh, security for up security. Uh, in the embedded uh, domain is still relevant. And some people will say it's a critical protection factor, though the uh, embedded entry uh, threshold is going up because even uh, the, e the simplest devices are be becoming more complicated. And on the other hand, there are lots of tools being developed. Uh, for instance, uh, in the past, uh, you couldn't uh, connect to JTAG uh, and 
you, it was almost next to impossible. But now, if you just Google uh, it, uh, you will uh, get a commercial of the shelf too. So you have to you have to understand what you need to do. But the uh, entry barrier. Uh, the entry barriers are basically going down. Right, uh, so let's wait for the uh, cultural um, and mindset shift. Good afternoon, thank you for a very detailed presentation. I have the following question. Uh, well, uh, given the ongoing situation across the world, you can, uh, it's difficult to buy STMs and uh, many uh, national vendors start using Giga devices and you are saying that Giga device uh, has its vulnerability, something needs to be done. What MCUs would you recommend? Uh, because as far as I understand, Giga device is an alternative to STM. Uh, the kernel is uh, slightly different, but the libraries are basically the same. So, uh, should we uh, move uh, to something else? Should we use, start using something else which has... Uh, uh, what uh, national vendor would you recommend? You mean something that Alexei didn't have a chance to analyze yet? Yes, indeed. Uh, as far as gig device is concerned, uh, lots of vulnerabilities were detected uh, in just a single research. Uh, other Chinese vendors ran their own researches uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are quite unwilling to uh, get rid of the detected uh, vulnerabilities. I would recommend looking uh, at uh, the microchip uh, because uh, they use ARM any, everywhere, uh, at least in this in the segment I described. And uh, the uh, tuning interface, uh, debugging uh, systems are different. Uh, but uh, it's not a silver bullet, you know, uh, because uh, MCUs and microchips uh, might uh, might be susceptible to very similar vulnerabilities. Uh, did you buy them? Uh, it's a provocative question. We we did, but uh, we didn't manage to research them yet. I have another question uh, about the. Uh, it's about the X XT uh, cipher. How come it was not covered initially? Uh, well, you managed. Uh, you mentioned the DES, uh, triple DES, RS4. Uh, uh, well, uh, initially we uh, uh, analyzed the STM uh, cryptographic library, and XT was not there. Uh, what about uh, GDE? Uh, so you're saying those were in-house uh, development? No, uh, you can find it online. It's a cipher which can be. Easily implemented in the hardware does not require that um, many resources. Uh, well, uh, we could have thought about using the XT, but we didn't have any open, uh, we didn't have clear text uh, attack options because initially we. Was, our assumption was about the info block uh, structure, and uh, our assumptions were not correct. We guessed everything uh, uh, right, but not the format. So.